everybody. Welcome to another episode of Politically Depressed. As always, I'm your host, Eamon McAdam. Today's an especially difficult day. I'm recording this episode on August 4th, 2024, which marks four years since the port explosion in Beirut. As I speak, the families of the victims who died on that day, who were murdered by the August 4th regime, are holding a vigil for their family members and friends who they lost on that day. And it's incredibly painful. I described earlier that it is four years since the explosion. In many ways, we are four years into the explosion. The blast has so altered the city and all its inhabitants, and it's kind of beyond description. I think it is an event, but also a structure that was represented by that event, that still exists. We've given it a name, the August 4th regime, because it kind of encapsulates, you know, the whole sectarian oligarchical system that we have in Lebanon, all of whom are complicit in the port explosion, all of whom fell in line with one another. Whatever they said in opposition to one another or against each other, they all defended each other intensely against any accountability or any anything. I don't know. Again, this has been another episode that's been really difficult I think it's a general thing. It it is related to the things I'm trying to talk about, but I had the same experience I had last week, wherein this is maybe the fifth or sixth time I'm recording this. And this time, it's just every time I, I burn out, I just get exhausted. I just find myself saying things and thinking, why am I saying this? What is the point of it? And I got a lot of like, nice messages from the last episode and a lot of hopeful kind of affirmations that, you know, I'm not just talking to the void and that, I don't know, what I'm sharing is valuable, but I don't see the value in it. I don't see the value in anything. I am also recording this episode today wherein, at the exact same time, everybody back home is incredibly fucking nervous. In my last episode, I talked about the massacre in the Jolan Heights, in Majd al-Shams, for whom the Israelis have so instrumentalized their deaths, you know, without any evidence to suggest their claims are true, that this was a Hezbollah rocket. They have gone ahead with it as though it were true, and as though it was enough for them to do, again, what they've always wanted to do, you know, which is, these assassinations, which is just to kill. And my God, in the last week they killed Fuad Shukr, the sort of number two of Hezbollah, or at least an incredibly high-ranking member. And Smail Haniya, like, holy shit. I find myself every single day waking up and thinking, fuck, they killed Haniya. Like, you know, I'm not... (laughs) Jesus... This is the guy who was leading the negotiations. This is... Whatever, I don't know. I don't want to do any analysis. It's just so fucked. And khalas, it is completely clear to anybody who it wasn't clear before, this genocidal regime will not stop. Again, not just these assassinations, but every single day, a new massacre, at least one, usually two or three in Gaza, every single day. They are bombing schools with displaced people in them and just bombing tents with these huge explosions. I have seen far too many beheaded babies and beheaded people. In the same day, they killed... um, I don't know if it's the same day, but they killed this journalist, Ismail al-Ghul. Like, I watched this... he's, He's huge. Like, it's insane. They just will not stop and nobody is fucking stopping them. And at the same time, 
the only people who can, you know, the people who have leverage, as in literally all the Western states that are backing it, that are joining in its war. It's unbelievable. It's so terrifying to see the complacency, to see Europeans taking photos of their vacations and Palestinians taking photos of their dead children, of tents on fire. I don't know, it's just so fucking dystopic, and I'm finding myself really burnt out. I think for like two or three days this week, I was not able to get off of the couch, and I just I just did nothing. Uh, and I don't know. I came across a phrase. It's actually funny, because I, I came across the phrase in a kind of inverted sense, and I didn't know that it had an original... Basically, I read a whole essay by Edward Said called Permission to Narrate. Very interesting, very different from what I expected it to be. Uh, but anyway, he has a long critique of Chomsky that I found very fascinating. It's a critique I hadn't heard before written in that way. But either way, one of his sort of like summation sentences is uh, pessimism of the intellect and pessimism of the will. And I, I read this out to my partner, and he kind of chuckled. He was expecting an optimism of the will. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And it turns out it's a phrase from Gramsci. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And as though my mother were this Italian anarchist in Mussolini's jail writing the sentence, it, it is something that she has basically said to me a thousand times. You can accept the reality and the grimness of the reality. And it's not a matter of delusion to then say, yes, it is fucked, but we will continue anyway. And that is another thing that I'm trying to internalize, but I can't. And I find myself, I find that to be the main sort of affect that's dominating me at the moment. I'm not really able to summon up this sort of optimism of will. I'm not able to talk. I mean, I anticipate that I will finish this sort of take, and I will edit it and send it off, and by that fact that there is still some sort of optimism, or some thing moving within me that says, like, this is worth it. But maybe it's just the momentum that I've created for myself. I don't know. Things are so entirely fucked. There are fascist mobs chasing down black and brown people in the UK. And that's a trend that I witnessed when I was there. Not in this sort of insanely barbaric form that it's taking, but I lived in the United Kingdoms, I lived in London, when Brexit happened. And I, you know what I mean? Like, there is a kind of linear line between... I mean, first of all, the sort of like 15 or so year reign of the Tories and then Brexit and then whatever. I don't know. There was one other thing. I mean, in general, I've been talking about the rise of the far right in Europe since 2015. And for a while, I was kind of dismissed. And I think a lot of people are still being dismissed and saying it's not that bad. Yet there are just a bunch of loonies and... I don't know. I think seeing these images probably is waking people up. And I think it's already too late. You know what I mean? Like, it's the same thing with Reza. Someone like John Oliver did an episode of his show about Palestine. And I think he used the word genocide, which is good. But, and I don't know if this is his first episode. I frankly don't care. It's just... How many dead children, how many dead Palestinians does it take for then, you know, some of these people to wake up to be like, oh, it is a genocide. Look, because it's hundreds of thousands. When since day one, even before October 7, it's been an incremental genocide, a policy of incremental genocide in Gaza. Rachel Corey, the American whatever volunteer who went to Gaza and was killed by the Israelis, was run over by a tractor while she was protesting in front of it. She described it as a genocide, and this is 2001. 
it's not something sorry to use you know I, I i don't mean to bring up rachel Corey in a kind of like authoritarian way of like even she says it but my point is is that it's so frustrating being in the situation wherein genuinely i am surrounded by people who don't give a shit for whom they will only give a shit they will only care once it affects them and even then because i think what we're seeing in cases like these fascist lynch mobs that are happening across like england i think it is only england i don't want to say the uk because i don't think shit like that's happening in scotland or in wales but this is people caring, right? Responding in a disgusting manner, in a vile manner. But you know what I mean? Like there's this idea that things will get bad and then we'll form communes and communism will rise because the problems come from the billionaire class and people will rise up against landlords and whatever. And it's like, no, like fascism grows exactly in the same kind of context. It's just that's the mobilization. You take people's grievances and you say like, oh, it's the fucking immigrant or whatever. And it's so emboldened now. It's so emboldened. And the right in general, across Europe, across the United States, are so organized. And again, I'm constantly, like, I want to stay a bit ignorant about certain contexts to kind of allow myself to be a bit optimistic, you know, to kind of be like, okay, I don't know, and hopefully there is that thing happening, you know, and something else, a strong left-wing, not just alternative, but mobilization and organization and pods and fucking collectives and i don't know i don't know there's so much that needs to be done at so many different levels and across geographies and i still don't fucking see it and again it scares the shit out of me to think that this isn't enough what is happening what is being shown what is being disseminated through social media is not enough to move people people don't care this is something i've been thinking a lot about for a very long time and especially since covid started which is how do you make people care how do you make people care I, honestly it's like you can't if people don't care they just won't care and if you try to make them care you're just a kind of inconvenience or you're after something you know but I experienced this a lot of the protests as well. Like people on the sidelines just are annoyed. They don't seem to be disagreeing. It's just like fucking, ugh, why are you doing this? Whatever. Or they just think we're fucking Islamists or whatever. But it's so much of this sort of getting on with their lives, shaking their heads at us. And this is most people. I live, again, very close to a tourist attraction here in Vienna. And so I see so many tourists and so many Europeans and so many white people just going about their summer, going about their holiday like it's just some other holiday, like it's just any other summer. And as much as you tell them that this is happening, eh, whatever is happening over there, as much as you tell them if this is being normalized over there, it is normalized over here, eh, whatever. It's no, that's not, you know, that's too far away. That's far-fetched. If you say people are being brutalized here in this country, not just here, but, you know, in, in almost every country where there are these, like, larger protests of, against genocide, they still think, you know, yeah, well, maybe, you know, they did something wrong or they were a bit too aggressive, maybe. Like, it's just, they're not piecing it together. And then they don't have this sort of, like, foresight and there's a kind of racism where they're not listening to us because they don't believe us because they think we're after something when we say we want this to end. Like, yeah, you want this because it's your people. And so when I make these arguments about it being, you know, which is also an incredibly dehumanizing situation to be in, where in, in order to make someone care, you have to be a bit smart about it and not say you should care because these are humans, you know, and they are being slaughtered on mass and you are complicit by you know jesus but anyway so to formulate to have to formulate an argument wherein okay but you understand that this then affects you 
that this will affect you. And by the time it affects you, like, you, you need to smell the winds of shit before it hits you. Especially here when I'm talking to, like, white people. Like, people in the imperialist centers. For whom all these things are so distant. Again, I know this might sound random. But I remember so clearly a few years ago, there was this flood that happened in Germany. That killed, like, eight people. And this woman was interviewed. And she was just so shocked and incredulous and she was like like people died here in germany like this isn't africa you know people don't die from floods here and she just so perfectly expressed i think the prevalent european psyche they really think they're in an island of them on their own and not just the european but also the many europe's across the world anyway I find myself rambling, but I don't know what else to do. Honestly, like, when I try to formulate an actual argument, I burn myself out. Because I'm like, what's the point of the argument? Who's not convinced? Who am I speaking to? What is the point of whatever? Um, if it's not about convincing, but informing, then it's like, I don't know, I, I'm honestly losing so much touch with the feeling of, like, the tangibility of the world. Honestly, that a lot of that started with the explosion. I started this episode by talking about the port explosion, and I do think that really marked a moment in my life wherein things just became incomprehensible. And it remains like that to this day. And, you know, it's a situation that is like thrust upon us wherein radical action and radical change needs to needs to happen otherwise we are doomed but because of those situations and because of prior situations we are unable to you know especially after the explosion i wasn't able to participate in protests like particularly after the explosion i was it so shattered any sense of strength that i had any i don't know even watching nostrallah's speeches you know, during the revolution, I would come back home from a protest, turn on the TV, I would know he'd be speaking, and I would have this kind of like, you know, contempt, and this sort of like power, this feeling of like, ha. But especially after the explosion, he would scare the shit out of me. And just just a speech, let alone like going out onto the streets or anything. And so, yeah, I don't know. Things are incredibly, incredibly fucked, and it really looks like they're about to get a lot worse. And I am, like many people, khalas, I've lost my mind. And I'm finding it increasingly difficult to just cope with my split realities. I have friends in Lebanon who are taking first aid courses, you know, like kind of, or organizing first aid response courses in anticipation of a wider war. And over here, I don't know, people are just fucking going to, like, dance things. I, I don't know, it's, it's honestly... I don't know. I don't know. I am still working on my video essay. That is something that I'm trying to keep doing as a kind of salvage. Maybe because it's a little detached. It is still obviously very related to the situation, but it's a bit of its own thing. And hopefully that'll give me some of this optimism of the will. Because I'm trying something new. But at the same time... Things are just incredibly fucked. And yeah, I can't reach any conclusions because things are constantly changing. And shifting. And yeah. And the only people who I know who aren't incredibly traumatized, who aren't... Living, you know, with this bare face reality of the brutality of these systems, you know, to me, the people who have a flexibility to do anything aren't doing anything. Again, that's that deeply frustrating split. Those who are traumatized, who are often already from marginalized communities, who are trying everything they can to do something, and at the same time, those who are not traumatized by these systems of domination, 
who in fact benefit from these systems of domination, who kind of feign sympathy or empathy, or at least claim empathy, don't do anything and are still stuck at step one. And I don't know. I don't know what to tell them because I don't know how to make people care. Genuinely, that is something that I will be thinking a lot about. How do I make people care when they don't care? It is such a deeply frustrating situation to be in. And I mean, this is me, but I know Palestinians are way more into this situation. Again, these videos I talk about wherein there's this sort of two second clip on Instagram and then it switches and completely to like a person in Gaza saying, please don't scroll. Click all the four buttons you see, spread this video, send money to my GoFundMe. And yeah, just like kind of trying really hard to get people's attention and keep their attention and ultimately to make them care. I don't know. I don't know. Again, I, I can't reach any conclusions these days. So that was just a kind of ramble. And I hope you appreciated it. So with that, this was another episode of Politically Depressed. If you enjoy this podcast or you appreciate the things that I share, please consider becoming a member of our Patreon with the link below or giving a one-time donation in the tip jar. And if you're not able to support this podcast financially, you can still support it by leaving it a review wherever you're listening to it or even just leaving it like a five-star rating. If you're on Spotify, it's super easy or Apple Podcasts. It's a really easy way to help this podcast grow. And yeah, so with that, I'll see you all next time. <laughs>